I've given my, the announced title for my talk, Do Immigration and Multiculturalism Erode the Welfare State? That's the descriptive title for my talk, and I am actually going to talk about that. I've given the priority in the title to the phrase, A Progressive's Dilemma, question mark, and I want to, I'll explain what I mean by that uh, as I develop the initial part of my talk. I start with the observation, I think, that it is one of the most compelling challenges facing Western nations to try to find a way to maintain and strengthen a sense of community, a sense of social solidarity, a sense of social integration and cohesion in increasingly diverse, increasingly ethnically diverse, increasingly racially and religiously diverse societies. We are as in Canada and in other Western nations, trying to find ways of reconciling multicultural diversity with a sense of a common identity, with a sense of a common sense of community, that sort of underlying set of ties that bind us and provide the commitment to mutual support and the sustaining of a welfare state over time. The talk I'm going to, t the issue I'm going to address tonight is what I see as a growing pessimism about our capacity to do that, about our capacity to simultaneously develop and understand and embrace a multicultural diversity on one hand, and on the other hand, to sustain and strengthen a redistributive welfare state on the other. I'll be talking about some of the sources of pessimism and pessimistic commentary on this as a possibility, but let me just say by way of introduction that I think this is part of a larger anxiety, which is growing in many Western nations, and I think is starting to creep into Canadian debates as well. An anxiety that there is a problem of social integration or social cohesion in our societies. We have, for decades in Canada, embraced diversity and celebrated it in our multicultural strategies. We have recognized, celebrated, and supported Diversity as a way of life is a fundamental element of Canadian society. But there is a growing concern in many countries that the real problem emerging in the current context is one of social integration, one of social cohesion, that the diversity is making it more difficult to sustain a common sense of community. I think that you can see this in many places. A few images capture some of it. In Europe, I think it's fair to say we are in wholesale retreat from the idea of multiculturalism as a defining direction for policy development. This particular picture comes from Germany, but the issue is perhaps most sharply poised or uh, <coughs> posed, sorry, in the contemporary period, probably in the Netherlands. But throughout Europe, an underlying concern that multiculturalism is making the integration of a society more difficult, and certainly retreat from multicultural policies in many societies. I don't have to linger long over some of the other flashpoints that we've seen, in this case in a country which did not march down the multicultural road, but clearly has serious issues about integration in a diverse society. The concerns are not, however, only in Europe. Countries which have been long-standing countries of immigration also resonate with an underlying anxiety. This is a picture on the left of Cronulla Beach, which is a very pleasant beach, just to the, on the outskirts of Sydney. And the picture on the right is a picture of the police descending on the beach on the day of the Cronulla riots, generated by tensions between Lebanese immigrants and the local community. This is a picture of another traditional immigrant society. In this case, major marches about immigration, defending and a stronger and more sympathetic immigration policy regime. But this was clearly a response to a kind of resistance and pressure pushback from the larger society. And so I would think that in many countries we are seeing an underlying anxiety about diversity as a social policy issue, or as a policy issue more broadly defined. Now in Canada, this is how we tended to think about multiculturalism. This is a picture of a citizenship ceremony. This is how we tend to think of it as a symbol of pride and something about, around which we continue to cohere. But I think even in Canada, we're beginning to see 
elements of anxiety creeping into our political debates. The current debate in Quebec about reasonable accommodation, the sharp debate in Ontario about Sharia law, the arrest of 17 young men, most of them second generation Canadians, for allegedly plotting to blow up a nuclear power plant on the edges of Toronto. We are beginning to generate some of our own anxieties around the interaction between diversity and social cohesion. And so I think there is this larger debate, flashpoints of cultural tension in many countries, driven in part by the security agenda post 9-11 bombings in London and Spain, debate about the integration of the second generation, the children of immigrants. Children of immigrants often have been on the front lines of some of the issues of violence that we faced and evidence emerging in a number of countries, including Canada, that the second generation may be less integrated than the first generation, the immigrant generation, has posed interesting questions for us to debate. That's the larger context. I want to focus more narrowly tonight on a particular dimension of this alleged tension between diversity and solidarity, or cohesion, I want to focus on the issue of social solidarity in the form of support for the welfare state and support for redistribution. Because increasingly we are hearing voices arguing that these two are in some deep tension. That increasingly diverse societies make it harder to sustain the political coalitions and the public attitudes that will sustain and support a welfare state over time. Voices that say that there is a tension and the more diverse we become, the more difficult it is to sustain social redistribution. And this has been dubbed by some the progressives dilemma. For those on the left have traditionally embraced both multiculturalism and redistribution. They have embraced immigration. They have supported a more multicultural sensitivity to the interests and concerns of newcomers to society and they've also supported a redistributive, traditional redistributive economic agenda. And what people are increasingly saying is, there's a tension. You can have, you can support multiculturalism. You can support the welfare state. You can't have both. The progressives, it's argued, have a dilemma. Now, why would and who would say this? The sorts of arguments that are made about what drives this progressive dilemma are diverse. There are <clears throat> two major forms of the argument. One argument is that diversity itself, the sheer fact, the sheer social facts of ethnic and racial diversity erodes redistribution. And there are a number of arguments that are sometimes put for this. One argument is that if your society becomes more diverse, more ethnically diverse, the natural tendency is for people to organize politically around their ethnic differences. People mobilize politically, they advance claims in ethnic terms, they fight out political agendas which are fundamentally about the accommodation of differences between groups. And the argument runs that tendency for politics to revolve around ethnic difference tends to crowd out crowd off the political agenda, leave less time for a politics of redistribution. The assumption seems to be there's a limited amount of political time, energy, and resources, and if you sort of devote your efforts to the accommodation of ethnic difference, you inevitably have less time, energy, and uh, reformist and their resources, <coughs> excuse me, for something that revolves around gaps between rich and poor more generally. So a crowding out effect. Another version of the argument is a corroding effect, that it goes further, that diversity tends to erode the sense of mutual commitment one to the other. It erodes interpersonal trust, an argument I'm going to come back to. It erodes mutual support, that people are less willing to transfer resources, to fund social programs that transfer resources to people who they see as other, people who they see as newcomers, people they see, in some sense, as less deserving of support from the social system as a whole. That it corrodes, breaks down the political coalitions that would otherwise be available to support a strong redistributive welfare state. A corroding effect. 
A third form of the argument is what I call collateral damage, which is slightly different. This form of the argument says, as societies become more diverse, as immigration increases, there's a danger of a backlash, a political backlash, against immigration, often drawing support from people who are at the margins of the economy, relatively unskilled people who are vulnerable economically, these people who would normally be supportive of the polit of progressive politics of the welfare state and redistribution may well, lead, may well be drawn to support parties which are opposing immigration. And so by voting against immigration, they inadvertently get a conservative politics on social spending, something they didn't vote for, but something which is, in effect, collateral damage from a politics which is a populist right-wing politics against immigration and diversity, a kind of phenomenon, an argument which resonated very much in France in 2000 when the socialist candidate wasn't on the final ballot in the presidential election, when Mr. Penn pushed the socialist off the agenda. That kind of fear of collateral damage was a major, resonated strongly in the forces of the political left in France and the States. So those are three kinds of reasons why some people think that diversity and redistribution there's a tension. A second version of the argument is not about the diversity, fact of diversity itself. It's not an argument about the sociology. It's an argument about the policy response of government. Here the argument is that diversity itself doesn't create a backlash, or if it does, it can be exacerbated by a political strategy of government to recognize and to celebrate, to support diversity. That is to say, if you adopt a, pol a policy of recognition or a multicultural strategy which celebrates diversity, supports it, and accommodates it, you then will generate the crowding out, corroding, or collateral damage dynamics. That is, the policy response to the state matters here. In addition to crowding or corroding and collateral damage you might get from a multicultural policy, some argue you get also get misdiagnosis. And by misdiagnosis, I mean that the minority groups themselves may begin to think that their problems are a product of a lack of recognition of their culture. When their real problems are a lack of housing, a lack of good jobs, a lack of strong social programs, problems they share with poor people in other minority groups as well. But they misdiagnose the problem and therefore misprescribe the solution. So, in this case, there are many, there are some people, Brian Berry, a political theorist I'll refer to in a moment, who have argued diversity, immigration, is not a problem at all. But if you adopt a multicultural strategy, a policy strategy, you generate a kind of politics that leads to crowding out, corroding, and misdiagnosis. Now, these are um, pretty strong sorts of arguments. Are they true? So let me start with the first question. Is there any evidence that high levels of immigration are associated with weak welfare states? Just to start, as a starting point. So... Now, what this tells you is that there's virtually no relationship whatsoever between the proportion of the population born outside the country and the proportion of a nation's resources devoted to social spending. That's about as flat a line as one can envisage. There's simply no evidence here in the first instance that countries with high levels of immigration have more difficulty developing social spending. Now, when we built this model and inserted the measures of the proportion of the population born outside the country, that non you know, the, the, the non-relationship remained a non-relationship. That is, there was no statistically significant relationship between the proportion of the population born outside the country and level of social spending when you control for other things we know do drive social policy expenditures. Now, there's two ways of thinking about this. One is that diversity itself is not a political challenge. High and stable levels of diversity were not a particular constraint systematically on social spending. But change, significant change in the proportion of the population born outside the country may be troubling. That would be one interpretation 
It may, that may be what's politically unsettling. That's one interpretation of the data. The other is that we need to go way beyond this to think more systematically and think a little bit more in causal terms. And one way of getting at that is to do some case studies of particular countries. This relationship here is driven by the experience of several countries. The Netherlands is perhaps the most extreme and interesting case. Large increase in population born outside the country, significant drop in social spending as a proportion of gross domestic product between 1980 and the year 2000. This is a country which is going through a crisis on multiculturalism and immigration issues, and it's also a country which significantly restructured its social expenditure. Now, people who have looked at this carefully, and there's a chapter in the book that uh, uh, Graham referred to on the Dutch case, suggest actually those two phenomena weren't related. The politics of neoliberalism or restructuring of the Dutch welfare state were unrelated to the politics of reaction against immigration and multiculturalism politics, that the one didn't drive the other. And so one will have to, we have to be careful about this. And so our next message, this is an argument which was made by the political theorist at Oxford, David Miller. So we looked at redistribution. It is a measure of the redistributive impact of taxes and transfers on the level of inequality in a society. And to what extent has that changed? So what was the change in the redistributive impact in relation to the size or strength of multiculturalism and policies? It looks like a small, slight downward slope, which is to say a negative slope. But in fact, in any regression analysis, there's no relationship at all. There's no relationship uh, when you take account of the other things that shape social spending between the strength of multiculturalism policies and the redistributive impact of the tax transfer system. So uh, my first take, first step, looking at some very simple cross-national stuff, is that I don't, we don't find a lot of evidence of any systematic deep tensions between immigration, recognition, and redistribution. There's some evidence that the pace of change may matter. Not sure how um, positively significant it is, but there's enough there to say that you know these are these issues are not silly, they're important issues to debate. The pace may matter, but there is not we find a deep systematic tension between diversity, recognition, and redistribution. This is pretty simple and doesn't take you very far. So what do you how do you push it forward? This kind of evidence is very limited. There's no relationship. Of, there's no understanding of whether, when you say there's no relationship, you don't know whether that means there's no relationship anywhere or there's a very positive relationship here and a very negative relationship there, and on balance, there's nothing there. I do think it's important that we challenge the idea that there is, in some sense, at some deep level, a universally uh, systematic trade-off or tension between diversity and redistribution. That, I think, that general proposition finds little resonance. And I would humbly su submit that although Canada has a lot of problems, and although the evidence on interpersonal trust is worrying, the fact that there's no negative relationship between diversity, the diversity, your own ethnicity, the diversity of your neighborhood, redistribution suggests that at least there's one other multicultural welfare state which produces a kind of counter narrative suggesting that there is greater possibility in our societies for different outcomes in the relationship between diversity and social solidarity, and that, at some level, probably public policy matters, the choices we make matter, and that we are not inevitably trapped in some corrosive relationship, that progressives are not trapped, I like to think, uh, in a deep an iron-like dilemma. 